At local time 8.23 on the 25th of February 2009, Turkish Airlines flight 1951, a Boeing 737-800, took off from Istanbul Atatürk Airport with destination Amsterdam and Schiphol Airport. It was flown by a Boeing 737-800 that was purchased by Turkish Airlines in March 2002, making it about seven years old at the time of the uh, accident. On board the aircraft, we had 128 passengers, four cabin crew and three pilots because this was a training flight and designated as the pilot flying on the flight was the first officer. Only a few hours later, this aircraft would have ended up crashing about one mile short of runway 18 right in Skipo. During the initial descent down towards the Islas Abroad for runway 18 right in Amsterdam, the crew experienced several spurious landing gear warnings. The pilots proceeded with the approach through the landing gate of 1000 feet without the aircraft being properly stabilized or prepared for landing and they did not notice that the speed kept creeping lower and lower and lower leading to a stall at an altitude of 420 feet above the ground from which the pilots were unable to recover. Why did this happen? Now before we start the explanation here, if you like these kind of videos where I explain you know, incident, accident or aircraft systems to you, make sure that you have subscribed to the channel and that you've highlighted the notification bell so you get all notifications when I send out new and exciting videos to you. What I'm going to do now guys is I'm going to give you a comprehensive view of the technical systems that were involved in this crash as well as how the crew interacted with each other and with the aircraft and why. So what you have to understand is that this flight was a completely normal flight to start with. The crew took off from Atatürk International Airport they climbed up to their cruising altitude of 36,000 feet and proceeded west one towards um, Amsterdam. What they didn't know though was that they had a technical issue with their aircraft that they still hadn't noticed. Now, in order for you guys to understand the implications of this technical failure, you need to understand a little bit about how the autopilot functions on the 737NG. So essentially, the 737NG have three different main components to the autopilot. You have the flight control computer A, flight control computer B, and the auto throttle computer. Now, the different flight control computers will give information to each pilot. Flight control computer A will give it to the captain, flight control computer B will tell it to the first officer, and they both have separate kind of input parameters. So the flight control computer A, for example, will have the separate pitot system, static system, uh, angle of attack vanes, and radio altimeter. And the same for the flight control computer B and it will show that information to their pilots, okay? If there is a failure in one of the systems, well then that means that only half of the cockpit is going to be kind of affected of it. Now, they will show a warning and the pilots need to figure out which one have the correct indications, but there are a checklist to do that. Now the outer throttle, the outer throttle takes its information primarily from flight control computer A, specifically in the case of the radio altimeter. Now, generally speaking, when we are flying on autopilot, only the flight control computer on the side of the pilot flying is actually telling the autopilot what to do, right? The other one is a backup. But there is a specific situation where both of the flight control computers are working together to fly the aircraft, and that is during a dual channel approach, hence the name. So when we have approach mode armed and we have engaged both autopilot A and autopilot B, well in that case, both of the autopilot will be giving instructions to the aircraft on how to fly. And if one of the autopilots suddenly says, dude, I want to go to the right here, and the other one says, no, 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 we'll continue straight ahead, then the, uh, the, the way that the aircraft reacts is that it will just disconnect both autopilots. And another function that we have during an autocoupled dual channel approach is that the aircraft isn't, is intending to do an autoland. 
In order to do a proper outer land, the aircraft needs to flare, right? Otherwise, it'll be a very hard landing. So there is a function in the autopilot system that when we go below a certain radio altitude, namely 50 feet, the autopilot will start to flare the aircraft. And as we descend through 27 feet, well then the radio altimeter will send that signal to the auto throttle and the auto throttle will reduce the thrust back to idle. Okay, that's in order for the aircraft to be able to land and to then slow down after the landing. Now that's really important for you to know because the failure that this particular aircraft has is a failure to the left hand radio altimeter. So there are two radio altimeters on the 737, one on the left and one on the right. And what they are are basically just a uh, sender and a receiver antenna at the bottom of the body of the aircraft. The sender sends out a radio signal that bounces off the ground, comes back into the receiver and then you know, you calculate the height of the ground based on how much time it took. This system is really, really accurate at lower altitudes, but not so accurate at higher altitudes, which means that the pilots are only being fed information on the primary flight display about the radio altimeter height when we are below 2,500 feet. On this particular flight, this radio altimeter on the left-hand side, so on the captain's side, started to malfunction just after departure. The flight data recorder, which was recovered after the crash, showed that at 400 feet, it started sending strange information to the uh, flight control computer on the captain's side. It basically said that it was minus eight feet. All right. Now, there are no indications that the uh, flight crew noticed any of this during the initial part of the flight, nor would you be expected to notice anything of that because the radio altimeter doesn't really have any function at this point. So the aircraft just continued to fly towards its destination. Now, this is not the first time that a Boeing 737NG had had problems with the radio altimeter at this time. In fact, there had been loads of reports from different operators all over the world to Boeing about spurious and intermittent problems with the radio altimeter. The problem was that when the technical department tried to go in and look for the source of the problem, they couldn't really find any because these faults, they would come up on one flight, disappear after a few seconds, and then it would work perfectly for three flights and then it might come back again. So Boeing and the technical departments at Turkish Airlines, for example, thought maybe this has to do with moisture creeping into the, uh, the antennas. So they started fitting the aircraft with these gaskets around the antennas and they insulated the connectors to make sure that this didn't happen, but it still happened from time to time. Because of this, Boeing had actually sent out a change to their dispatch deviation procedure guide. This is a, a, a document that you read prior to dispatching the aircraft if you have a failure. And the DDPG now said that if there was a problem with the radio altimeter, well then you shouldn't be using the auto throttle for subsequent approaches. Now the issue with that is that this document is only really read prior to departure. While we're in flight, the pilots will be reading from the QRH, the Quick Reference Handbook, and in the Quick Reference Handbook, there were no such uh, instructions. Now the, the, the kind of thought from Boeing on that was that if a pilot is up flying and gets a faulty indication or the auto throttle is not working the way it should be doing, well then you can just disconnect it, right? It's the job of the pilots to monitor the instrumentation and how the aircraft is behaving. And if the system is not behaving the way it should be, then it's perfectly possible to disconnect the auto throttle and fly the approach with manual thrust or even fly it manually. Now on this particular flight, in the flight deck, we have three pilots. And the reason for that was that this was a line flight under supervision or a line training flight, okay? In the captain's seat, we have a really senior line training captain, Captain Hassan Tassin Arisan. He is uh, 54 years old, one of the most senior training captains at Turkish Airlines at the time, and an ex-military fleet commander. He is training another ex-military pilot, First Officer Murat Seser. Murat is 42 years old. He has over 4,000 hours of uh, fast jet time in the Turkish Air Force. But this is only his 17th flight with Turkish Airlines. So he is being 
trained into his new role as a first officer. Now in Turkish Airlines at the time, uh, during line training and below 20 sectors, you need to have a safety pilot. That means a pilot who is monitoring that the flight crew are doing what they're supposed to, helping the line training captain out in case you know he needs to be focusing on instruction to make sure that nothing bad happens. He's also there in case something would happen to the captain so that he could jump into that role and, and help the training first officer out. During that role was uh, first officer Olgay Öskur. Uh, Olgay is only 28 years old, but he's still fairly experienced. Um, he has worked about three years for Turkish Airlines at the time, and he had previous experience with flying the MD-80. Anyway, pilot flying for the flight is the training first officer uh, Murat. So as they're getting closer towards Amsterdam, Murat started to take up the weather for, um, for Amsterdam skip hall. And the weather indicated a kind of okay but marginal weather. So there was indicated clouds at 600 feet with an overcast cloud layer at 1100 feet and the visibility was 3500 meters but going down temporarily to 2500 meters. The flight crew discussed which type of approach to fly and they, des they decided that um, it was perfectly okay to fly a category 1 ILS approach into runway 18 right, which was in use for, uh, for the approach. A category one ILS approach will allow the aircraft to fly down to 200 feet and to a visibility of 550 meters. So first officer Murat is now setting up for the approach and he's starting his approach briefing for the captain and for the safety pilot. And at this point, the aircraft is flying completely normally. There are no warnings, no indications that anything is wrong. At time 9.53, they initiated their descent with Dutch air traffic controls. Um, the cockpit voice recorder is indicating that they got a lot of different heading changes, altitude changes and speed changes, which is completely normal when you fly into Amsterdam. Amsterdam is one of the more busy airspaces in Europe. and. Uh, Eventually, they get into contact with Amsterdam Area Control. Now, Amsterdam Area Control clears them to descend to flight level 70 towards a point called Artip, which is part of the standard arrival procedure for runway 18 right in Amsterdam. And the contact skip pull approach control. The, the captain, who is the pilot monitoring, does that. He contacts skip pull approach and tells them where he's going. And skip pull approach comes in and tells him to proceed direct to the VOR spiky bore and descend to flight level 40, which is 4,000 feet. Now, up until this point, the descent has been completely normal. There hasn't been an indication of anything being wrong. But here, during the time when the captain is speaking to approach control, is the first indication that something is wrong with the flight. Because as we are listening to the cockpit voice recorder, you can hear how the landing gear warning horn suddenly starts sounding. Now the landing gear warning horn uh, is a system that is there to remind the pilots that they have forgotten to take in the gear down prior to landing. The system is connected to both the configuration of the aircraft, as in what flap setting we have, um, the thrust lever angle, but also, crucially, to the radio altimeter. Okay, so as this warning is going on, it's, it actually goes on for about a minute and a half, and that's a very long time to be listening to that warning. During that time, on the cockpit voice recorder, you can hear how the captain is muttering uh, radio altimeter and landing gear, indicating that he's looking at his primary flight display, that he sees, a strange value and from the uh, flight data recorder we know that it was indicating minus eight feet at this point and that he recognizes that the warning that he's hearing is the landing gear warning horn. Now the warning then cuts out but it will come back several times during the approach but just intermittently. The aircraft is now being cleared to descend down to 2,000 feet and turn onto a heading of 265 degrees, which is kind of an inis initial base leg to intercept the aircraft uh, to the ILS from a 18 right. When the aircraft reaches 2,000 feet, the first officer calls for flaps 1 and reduces the speed back to 195 knots. Now, during this time, the autotrottle is working perfectly. 
Okay, um, as the speed is being reduced to 295 on the mode control panel, the auto throttle just brings the thrust back until the speed has been established and then comes back up again like a good boy, like the way it's supposed to be working. Soon after this, uh, air traffic control gives the crew its final heading, heading 210 degrees, and they're now cleared for the ILS approach for runway 18 right. Now, in the standard operating procedures of Turkish Airlines at the time, all approaches are supposed to be flown as dual channel approaches when available. So this means that because they're now getting their final approach heading and they're clear for the approach, the first officer's pilot flying is supposed to engage the second autopilot to make it a dual channel approach. Now, he now makes a mistake which is very common among cadets. Like when I'm training, this happens all the time. And that is that instead of arming the approach mode first and then engaging the second autopilot in order to set it up for a dual channel, he does it the other way around. He switches the command A on before approach. Now, when you do that, what you're essentially telling the aircraft is that you want the other autopilot to be in command. So in normal circumstances, when everything works the way it should, it just switches over from command B to command A and continue flying on autopilot. But when the first officer makes these mistakes and switches on command A, what happens is that the autopilot disconnects itself, right? The first officer reacts to this by just re-engaging command B, but he doesn't really talk anything else about it. He doesn't mention it more and there's no discussion going on uh, with the captain. So this is actually an indication that something is definitely wrong with the autopilot flight director system. It should not react like this. But anyway, the crew continues to fly. The first officer does not try to engage the second autopilot again. And soon thereafter, he calls for flaps five, continues to reduce the speed back to 170 knots. And here you can once again hear the landing gear horn going off just for a short while this time. The first officer then goes to ask for flap 15, followed by gear down, right? The procedure at Turkish Airways at the time was to select gear down and flaps 15 uh, as the glide slope becomes alive. But the crew is now finding themselves in a fairly tricky position. And that is because in uh, Skippo approach control at the time, they have made it a habit to close the aircraft in on a very tight circuit, basically aiming to vector the aircraft to intercept the glide slope and the localizer at 6.2 miles. Generally, when we fly everyday kind of approaches, we tend to intercept maybe eight to 10 miles because that will give you a little bit more room to intercept the glide slope from below. But in this case, the crew had been getting a, a vector of 210 degrees. Now, if that would have been a track, they would have intercepted the glide slope and the localizer at 6.2 miles, which would have been perfect. But because there has been a little bit of westerly wind at this altitude, the aircraft has actually been pushed to a track of 201 degrees instead. And this will have them intercepting the localizer at five and a half mile and above the glide slope. And that is going to become very important. Anyway, the first officer is doing a good job here. He's anticipating that oof, we are going to have to descend like a rock later on. So he's getting the gear out and the flaps 15 and the speed back. They intercept the localizer. Captain calls localizer intercepted. And after this, things happen very, very quickly. And it's important for you to understand why this has an impact. Because as the localizer is now being captured, the someone is reaching up and changing the MCP altitude from 2000 feet, which is what they were cleared at, to first 1200 feet and then 700 feet. Okay. Then vertical speed is being initiated with initially 500 feet per minute descent and then 1400 feet per minute. This is being done because if you get localizer intercept but you're above the glide slope, Okay. The glide slope will not capture and you cannot descend the aircraft away from your MCP selected altitude without changing it. Right? And you have to change it quickly down, get the aircraft descending quickly because as you're getting closer towards the runway, the glide slope will go lower and lower and go further and further away from you. So if you're not quick and you don't do this quickly, it's very likely that you will miss the glide slope completely and you won't be able to fly the approach. This is why it's likely that it wasn't the first officer 
who did this, but it was actually the captain who saw that this was about to happen, reached out and now is starting to input on the autopilot while the first officer is still pilot flying. But something that has happened now, which they haven't noticed, is that the uh, roll bar on the captain's flight director has disappeared. Okay? Now this is significant because during a dual channel approach, when the aircraft comes at about 50 feet of the runway, both the localizer and glide slope bars on the flight director disappears out of view. That's because we're not supposed to use them for a flare okay the aircraft will be flaring automatically but in any case we're not supposed to be looking at the flight director during that part of the uh, of the approach so if they are over the runway this is normal all right but at this point as they get localized the capture the roll bar disappears the aircraft is now descending the workload is expected to be quite high here because the captain is actually doing the job of the first officer while still trying to monitor the situation at the same time, the, the safety pilot has been in contact with the cabin crew. The cabin crew calls in to tell them that the cabin is ready for landing. Right? So he's looking the other direction. It's likely that he never noticed that this happened to the, uh, to the flight director bar on the captain's side. And even if they would have noticed, it's unlikely that they would have understood the significance of it. Now, you might ask yourself, what is the safety pilot doing at this point? And actually, the safety pilot around this point is pointing out to the captain that, remember that you have a uh, radio altimeter failure on your side. And the captain responds with kind of a, yep, a firm, but there's no further kind of discussion. And in fact, none of the warnings that they've gotten up until the point, not the, um, the landing gear horn, not the uh, faulty kind of radio altimeter indication has led to any real discussion among the crew about why this is and what kind of implications it could be. So the aircraft intercepts the glide slope. As they intercept the glide slope, the pitch bar on the captain's flight director also disappears, indicating kind of the same as we were talking before. As they're descending now, and they've been descending with a much higher vertical speed than normal, what happens when you do that is that the aircraft will accelerate. And the auto throttle, as the speed is accelerating away from the set value that the pilots have selected on the mode control panel, will try to reduce the speed, right? So the auto throttle has moved into a retard, as in into approach idle at this point. Now, the pilots wouldn't think that this is strange. This is actually what it's designed to do. So the fact that the outer throttle is sitting there and there's absolute idle on would not kind of raise any suspicions by the flight crew. The problem is, though, that it hasn't gone into retard because of the high speed. It has actually gone into the flare retard mode because it thinks that it's actually during a flare before landing. So the outer thrust will sit in the full retard mode for the next 98 seconds. Now, Skipple Approach has seen that the aircrew have established themselves on the localizer. They tell them to contact Skipple Tower. The captain, who is pilot monitoring, calls into Tower and the Tower tells them that they're clear to land runway 18 right. This is the last communication that air traffic control will have with Turkish Airlines Flight 1951. The aircraft continues to descend and the captain next calls out 1000. Now this is really important because in Turkish Airlines at the time, the landing gate is 1000 feet. Now what means with the landing gate is that when you pass that altitude, the aircraft has to be completely established and ready to land. You need to have completed your landing checklist, the aircraft need to be fully configured, uh, you need to have the correct speeds beyond the localizer and glide slope and the thrust needs to be up to its approach value. And on a flaps 40 approach, when you have flaps 40 selected, the thrust is normally sitting between 55 and 60 N1. At this point, the flaps have not been selected to 40, thrust is still at idle and the landing checklist has not been completed. So the flight crew has actually passed the landing gate without being properly established. Right? So what they should do at this point is they should execute a go around. Right? This is why we have landing gate, so that there is no choice. Okay? There's no ambiguity here. If you pass the landing gate without being properly established, you go around, no questions asked. But in Turkish Airlines, it's also the SOP that the captain is the one that decides if a go around should be flown or not. 
And in this case, he doesn't call for it, so the safety pilot and first officer doesn't question it. They continue the approach. At 900 feet, the first officer calls for flaps 40. Flaps 40 is selected, and then someone tries to arm the speed brake. Right? This is also part of the landing checklist. But what happens on this occasion is that as the pilots start to arm it, they get both the speed brake armed and the speed brake do not arm warning light. The reason they're getting this is probably also connected to the problem they have with the radio altimeter. Because once the aircraft is on the ground, uh, you will actually get this warning. But the implication for them as they're arming it is that there is actually a quick reference handbook checklist to be done. If you get that kind of warning, it is an indication that the speed brake will not come up automatically and you need to do that yourself. So there is a checklist that needs to be done and there's actually a performance calculation because it will have an impact on our landing distance. Anyway, this is completely disregarded. The, uh, um, the speed brake is left with both of these lights illuminated and they continue to descend. So at this point, the uh, captain is starting to challenge the landing checklist and they go through it point by point as they're now descending down. Uh, the last point on the checklist is cabin crew seats for landing. Um, they now realize that they haven't been talking to the cabin crew. So the uh, captain turns over to the safety pilots and tells him to please seat the cabin crew. Safety pilot tells the captain that yeah we got cabin secure earlier and he reaches for the PA mic and starts making the PA for the cabin crew to seat down. The aircraft is now at 500 feet descending, the captain calls out 500 feet but what has happened now is that instead of coming up with a thrust to keep the speed that they indicated 144 knots that they should be keeping, the thrust is still in the retard position. And the way that this impacts the flight is that as the speed is now decelerating down below 144 knots, the only way for the aircraft to keep the glide slope is to increase its nose position. So the nose keeps pitching back, 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 back. And at this point, it's probably around 10 to 11 degrees nose up, which is an extremely high nose position for this configuration at this point. Generally, when we're flying a flaps 40 normal approach, you should have about zero. So the nose should be sitting on the horizon as we're descending down on the glide. Here it's sitting to you know, 10 to 12 degrees nose up, which is not normal. The next thing that happens is that they get stick shaker activation. Okay. The speed is now below 107 knots and it touches the lower red barber's poles on the primary flight display. And that starts the stick shaker and basically whenever we get a stick shaker you need to react very very quickly. Okay, Because you're about to stall, you haven't stalled yet but you're about to stall. As the stick shaker activates the safety pilot cries out speed, speed, speed. And there is an indication on the, uh, on the flight data recorder that the nose is being pushed forward and the thrust is being pushed forward as well to about mid position. It's likely that it is the first officer who's pilot flying who's doing this. Remember, he has been just recently in the simulator having done his type rating training, so he would have done approach to stall and recovery quite recently. But at this point, the captain calls that he has controls. As soon as he does that, the thrust goes back down to idle again because the outer throttle is still engaged, it's still in retard mode, so it just pushes it back. And initially, the captain seems to be pushing the nose forward. That brings the aircraft out of stick shaker for a few seconds. And then about nine seconds later, the captain realizes that they don't have any thrust. He brings the thrust levers up, disconnected the outer throttle and the autopilot, and raises the nose. But the problem is that this is all too late. It takes four seconds for the engines to spool up from approach idle to full thrust. And during that time, the aircraft enters into a full stall. And this is only at 400 feet from which it is impossible to recover. The last indications on the cockpit voice recorder is the ground proximity warning system warnings for pull up, terrain, terrain, pull up. And then the aircraft crashes into the ground and all recording stops. 100, 50, 40, 50, 50, 50, 50. 
The aircraft hit a field about 0.9 nautical miles prior to the threshold of runway 18 right. It hits with the tail section first and it breaks into three different pieces. The engine disattaches from the wings and gets thrown about a thousand feet further than the aircraft body and the uh, cockpit slams hard into the ground. This kills one cabin crew, five passengers and also the three pilots in the cockpit. So what did the final report reveal then? Well, the final report basically said that there were several factors that impacted the outcome of this flight. They said that the failure of the pilots to go around when they passed the landing gate without being fully established was one of the causes. Also, the fact that they you know, did not monitor their airspeed enough to realize that the thrust was in idle and that the speed was going you know, down well below their uh, minimum approach speed also led to it. But the fact that there was a technical malfunction on the uh, radio altimeter that caused the outer throttle to reduce back to idle and stay there was definitely a part of the blame. On top of this was also air traffic controls um, decision to give them this tight vector. Now it had been a standard procedure in Schiphol at the time to give these tight vectors but the fact is that the actual rules um, for Dutch air traffic control at the time stated that they should have given them much more distance. They can give them a short approach but they have to indicate that to the air crew because the air crew can then mentally prepare for the higher workload that will come to that. So that was also one of the findings. Another finding was the way that the pilots executed the approach to stall and recovery maneuver, which was deemed insufficient. Uh, this was then disputed by the airline. The airline did not agree to this. Uh, but what has happened and what we as pilots have kind of experienced after this is that the amount of training when it comes to approach to stall and recovery has changed quite a bit. Okay, it used to be training at high altitude only. After this incident, we started practicing approach to stall and recovery, both at high altitude, but also in traffic circuit altitude and on final approach, because the way to handle it is actually quite different. The fact that you have so much more drag when you're in a landing configuration makes the, the um, recovery from the approach to stall quite a bit more tricky. So. That was a change. We also included the approach to stall and recovery training in recurrent training. So prior to this incident, that wasn't a requirement. You could basically just do it as part of the type rating and then never do it again. But after this, it was included in the recurrent training. So at least you would do it every three years. And in fact, we are doing it quite more often than that right now. After this incident, there has also been all sorts of different kind of um, contestations to the final report, both by Turkish Airlines, but also by Boeing. And the, um, the final report has been, have had to be revisited several times after this, but the, the facts kind of stays the same. So I really hope that you're enjoying this uh, series that I'm doing about famous air crashes and investigations. If you want to see more of it, I have a full playlist up here that you can check out. And please let me know what else you want me to talk about. Sign them in in the comments here below and I will try to answer as many of your questions as possible. I also want to send a huge thank you to the sponsor of this episode, which is NordVPN. Now I use NordVPN myself, especially when I'm out traveling to, you know, through airports or restaurants where I might be using um, local Wi-Fi's. It's very good to know that my data will not be able to trace when I do so, but to be perfectly honest, what I use it the most for is to get past these pesky uh, regional restrictions when it comes to Netflix, for example. Uh, you know, by the click of a button, I can just change my location to be in the United States and there's loads more and better um, TV shows to watch there. If you are interested in this, then use the link here below that link will give you a whopping 68% discount on the two year deal with NordVPN. And you can use that deal to up to six different devices on the same deal. So go down, click the link and consider supporting me by supporting them. Northwest 5 with you. Two, please go around, Jet 262, go around. Go around, Jet 262.
Turkish 1951, descent to flight level 70, after Arthur to Sierra Papalima. 1951. Good morning, Turkish 1951, descent to 70, speed 250. Turkish 1951, hello, proceed Sierra Papi Yankee, descent to 40, speed okay for ILS 18 right. 10 and 4, 5, 9, behind the company, 777, line up and wait, Romeo 18, behind. Behind the 777, line up and wait, behind 10 and 4, right 9. Correct, Shamrock 023 behind the Scandinavian and the AT on the right hand side, line up and wait, runway 24, Sierra 6 behind. Left 265, 1951. We'll line up and wait, uh, 24 behind the Scandinavian, Shamrock 023. Correct, correct, Arco 5107, caution, jet blast, over. Oh, disregards. Line up and wait, 140, KLM 61. Departure normal air, 61 2000. Flight level 105, climb with flight level 140. Canon 59, Foxtrot, good day. Direct to BDM and climb to flight level 250. 250, Canon 5, Canon 4. Direct code 2000. Turkish 1951, turn left, heading 210, clear the bridge, 18 right. 200 clear, 185, touch 195. Good morning, Yacht 262. Hello again, Yacht 262, maintain 2000 feet. Two traffic heading is to down, speed at 380. Roger, sir, maintain heading 270. Turkey's 1951, contact tower, 1827, bye bye. Two down over the tank, sir. Four and heavy, out of two, flight level 60. Two to 60. Cat 1352, good day to you. Flight Norco 2 Alpha arrival, descent to flight level 200, it's runway 18 right. Norco 2 Alpha arrival, runway 18 right, descent flight level 200, KLM 15, correction, KLM 1352. That's a feed stabilized, Mr. Burnt Challenge, 2 to 7.